Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Pam and Betty, and thank you all for being here. I have uh, enjoyed thinking about this a little bit since Pam asked me to help, and I, um, I hope that I can shed some useful light. When Pam asked me to do this, I started thinking about how many good comparative trials do we have in surgery, and I thought, not very many, not very many at all. And uh, so I hoped I could come up with something to talk about. So I thought I'd talk about medicines first. But first of all, I just want to say that it's, it's very important to think about this. And what I, as I was thinking, I, I was thinking of the various biases that come up. And I did a little literature search, and I found just a few to mention here. And I'm not going to go through each of them by name, but I'll just tell you, for example, the first one, an anchoring bias means that you take one fact and you weight it too heavily for all the other facts that are out there. And as physicians and surgeons, we're very likely to do that. If we see one patient who did, really did well with one treatment and it was our last patient, well, that'll be fresh in our mind as opposed to looking uniformly at all of the literature and saying, overall, what's the best thing? How do we, how do we make these judgments? And it's the same thing for patients as well. You know, you know somebody who had a great outcome or you know somebody who had a terrible outcome and that one person or that one event will really influence your thinking. And so. There are many different kinds of bias. Um, I'll show you a couple here. I, I think this one's interesting. Uh, for those of you who sit on that side of the room, I'm gonna read this cartoon to you. On the top, there's a man with a cl the clipboard, and he says, lifelong smokers have a one in two chance of dying from smoking or related disease. And the person on the right smoking a cigarette says, it'll never happen to me. And then down below, he says, the odds of winning the Powerball lottery are 80 million to one. And he says, this could be my lucky day. <laughs> So obviously a little bit of bias here going on. Well, it's possible though that this might be his grandmother lighting up on her 100th birthday, you know? So maybe he thinks, you know, this isn't gonna be me. Um, and I, you can see how easily we're affected by individual events. Uh, the framing effect, you know, as a surgeon, when I'm talking to somebody about the treatment options, I talk about observation, I talk about radiation, I talk about surgery, I talk about medical treatment. I try to always get my colleagues involved, you know, so that somebody who's a specialist in medical treatment, somebody who's a specialist in radiation oncology has a chance to talk to them as well, because I know I have my own biases. And I try to mitigate that by having people talk to many people, and I think, uh, it's a good policy when you have a complicated disease like NF uh, that you get various opinions and particularly seek out experts because a lot of what we'll tell you is expert opinion and it's not really based on a lot of great data yet. We're getting there. So this is the framing effect. The glass is half full or the glass is half empty. And here's an example of this. Um, you know, this is supposed to be frozen yogurt contains 20% fat. Okay, would you want that? Well, I don't know. You might want the one that says frozen yogurt, 80% fat free, you know? <laughs> and as a surgeon, you know, when I'm talking to people about this is the likelihood, if I say that you're, we're gonna, there's a 90% chance we'll save your facial nerve, they might say, well, that sounds reasonably good. But I say there's a 10% chance we're gonna lose your facial nerve. Ooh, I don't want that, you know? <laughs> so uh, we see these things and we have to try to balance them and it's not easy. So, so um, one of the things that I was thinking about is this philosophy. This is one that I pulled out of my father's philosophy book. He had a lot of these sayings, but Samuel Johnson said, nothing will ever be attempted if all possible objections must first be overcome. Sometimes that can happen in trying to make a decision about what to do. And you have to think, we take the best information we have and we move forward at times with what we think is the right thing. So I'm gonna give you, um, Two other, and this is actually from Pam's a quote from her, is, the treat, is this treatment better than that treatment? I, I think we need to ask that question all the time. And then can we predict which choice will be a better fit for an individual? Then we have to do the best we can with the information. So um, two examples, one is a medical example and one is a surgical example. Uh, Lapatinib and Bevacizumab, okay? I think we're both, we're familiar with these in the NF2 community. They're both drugs that have been tried in, in clinical trials. And when we look at the level of evidence, as uh, Betty mentioned, you know, the, the meta-analysis or what we really want to see, we want to have a lot of randomized controlled trials to look at. They all come together and we make a sound decision based on really strong data. We don't have too many of those. Uh, randomized controlled trials, uh, not too many of those. Cohort studies, uh, maybe some case controlled studies, yeah. And this would, I, I would say this is probably a case, con these are case controlled studies. These are patients who had progressive tumors, either they were losing their hearing or their tumor was growing and they were entered into one of these studies. 
Um, in the lapatinib study that was done by Matthias Karyanis and his colleagues in 2012, their goal was initially to estimate the response of the tumors to this drug. And so they said the patient had to be older than three years of age. They put kids in the study. They had to have NF uh, that was progressive in at least one ear with a vestibular schwannoma that was either growing or their hearing was going down. And they enrolled 21 patients of whom 17 completed the study. And it was a very nice study design. The patients were their own control because they had known progression of disease. 15% um, of the patients, or the, the primary outcome was a 15% decrease in tumor size. This is an interesting one because in NF2, if we could just stop the tumors from growing, we'd be really happy with that. But in most oncology studies, you have to show the tumor shrinking, and so that was the endpoint that they chose. And then the other secondary endpoint they chose was whether or not it helped the hearing. Does it help stop the loss of hearing? Does it help stop the decrease in the clarity of the hearing? So in their results, they found that four out of 17 patients had a decrease in their tumor size, and four of 13 patients had an increase in their hearing. So you look at that, and if you were trying to decide, do I want to go on lapatinib, you'd say, well, that's, that's not great odds, but, um, how toxic is the drug? Is it going to make me sick? Well, how fast will I progress if I go on the drug? You know, the median time to progression is 14 months. Um, toxicity, mostly minor, rashes and diarrhea. Not in this study, but in other studies that have looked at lapatinib, liver toxicity can really be severe, even fatal. And it's very rare, but it's something to be concerned about. So uh, they concluded that there was some objective activity in a few patients with lapatinib, and they thought it might be used in, for progressive vestibular schwannomas and maybe looking forward into combination with other drugs. I thought they were very conservative in, their, in the, what they said, and the reason I thought that is because of this waterfall plot. Uh, I hope you can see it from over there, but basically what it shows is that most of the patients on the near side of the graph uh, did not have tumor growth. Below the line shows patients whose tumor did not grow. True, there were only four that met the 15% by volume decrease criteria that they had set, but most of the others didn't grow. There were five or six that did, but most of them, let's see, there's five, six that did, and the others on the 17, the 11, other 11 did not grow at all. And I thought that's actually quite encouraging. You know, and, and that, the more data we have, the better decisions we can make. Now what about bevacizumab or Avastin? Uh, Dr. Plotkin did the first study on this and showed that about 50% of patients had their tumors decrease in size, and likewise around 50% had an improvement in their hearing, and others are now taking this up, and I pulled up this study from the UK where their NF2 research group uh, did a prospective study at, with 61 patients, and uh, the mean follow-up was almost two years. The partial volumetric response of the tumor shrinking was about 40%, and, and uh, stable in 51%, which is quite good and their age and pretreatment growth rates were predictive of response. Younger patients uh, seemed to do, have more growth and the older patients had less. Um, whoop, let's see, so um, they concluded that the hearing was maintained or improved in 86%, not bad. Their quality of life scores improved. The side effects of hypertension and protein in the urine uh, were 30% and 16% respectively. And they said that the rate of surgery overall in the UK had decreased substantially since they'd started using bevacizumab for these patients. And they said, interestingly, that the complications associated with surgery had also decreased because they weren't doing so. We weren't doing as much surgery. Interesting perspective. All right. So this is their. This is actually Scott's waterfall plot from 2012, a, a follow-up on a number of his patients, and this is reversed from the lapatinib study. But this, but the same thing holds true. Actually, the patients on the left-hand side are the ones who had tumors that grew. The right-hand side are the tumors who didn't shrink significantly but shrunk somewhat, and then those that shrunk by 20% or more are here. And so you can see that a large number of patients on bevacizumab did not progress or or shrunk. That's great, that's a great outcome. If it weren't for the side effects, it'd be perfect, right? And, and the cost. So this is an overall plot of what their hearing did. And uh, just to explain this, the, the speech discrimination score is along the bottom. Um, moving upward is good, so if you improve by 40 or 50%, that's tremendous. And this is the pure tone average, and the less 
the, the lower the pure tone average, the better. So if you're in the green box up here, it means your hearing got better. Or if you move to the left on the chart, it means your hearing improved in terms of the speech discrimination score. If you're down in the red box, it means something got worse. But you see that most of the patients actually held, either held up their own or, or moved in a good direction. That was very encouraging. Now, here's my anchor. Here's my anchor bias. Had a patient who has NF2 who had these tumors on the left pretreatment, and he said, I don't want to have surgery. And I said, your brain stem is getting very thin right here, and it's get really getting smashed by this small tumor and this large one on the left. I said, we need to do something. He said, I don't want to have surgery. Every time I have surgery, I get worse. You wouldn't think I'm a surgeon saying these things, but, it's, but some people say that to me. So he didn't have surgery with me before he got worse. It was other people. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, he said, isn't there anything else we can do? And this is right when Scott had first written about bevacizumab, and I said, well, let's, let's try this and see if it works. And then here's his one-year post-bevacizumab scan. You see his brainstem's got a little more breathing room. And so when I think about this case, I think, oh, man, I should be trying this for a lot of people. You know, and in fact, when patients have really tough surgical problems, it really is something to, to consider. And... Um, I, I'm not going to go through all of the complications on bevacizumab, but uh, the two that are common are the hypertension and the proteinuria. But uh, the other question is, do we see a rebound effect when we stop bevacizumab? If we have to stop it for a complication, do the tumors grow again? And um, here's, the, here's a, a rebound effect from the study that Scott and Jayshree Blakely did. And you can see that some patients do rebound and some patients don't. And there's still, still a little bit of a controversy about that. But I would say in general, you know, if this is the line that stopped, most of the tumors do resume their growth rate when they stop the bevacizumab. So it's not really killing the tumor. It's just holding it up, keeping it from growing. So uh, another thing is the cost. You know, it depends a lot. Your, your choice might have something to do with how wealthy you are or whether or not your insurance company is going to be participated in this because bevacizumab costs between forty dollars and $50,000 a year. And if your insurance company is not going to help you, uh, that might restrict your decision a little bit. Uh, interestingly, a couple of years ago, there was a, a, a drug that came out of Egypt that was a, a counterfeit, you know, and so they're selling this as bevacizumab because it's so expensive. And, I never thought of that as a way to, you know, game the system. But lapatinib is not cheap either. And although the prices come down, and I think you can buy it on the black market for $50 a month now, I'm really not sure that's where you want to go. But they're both very expensive drugs. And I think it's a consideration when you're thinking about what you're going to do. So is there a bias? Well, there, there is. I mean, there was a study in neurosurgery where they were looking at all of the levels of evidence of all the different treatment options. And they said, what is the role of bevacizumab in the patients with NF2? And their level three recommendation, meaning not really strong, but based on the evidence they had, they recommended that bevacizumab be administered to reduce tumor size or prolong stability or hearing in patients with NF2 without surgical options. If you can't operate on them, give bevacizumab. And say, so, well, I don't know, you know, we probably ought to talk about both. But um, when we talk to patients, we think about all the pros and cons of surgery and radiation, observation, medical treatments. You know, is the tumor growing? Is it uh, progressing? Is their hearing getting worse? Um, here's a young man that came in to see us from Florida who has bilateral schwannomas, one here and one here. And they're not really big. They're just kind of in the internal auditory canal. But um, his hearing was normal. And here is the coronal view. And you can see that actually there, on the right side there are two tumors. On the left there are probably two that are fused together here as well. And when we looked at this, we said, what should we, what should we do with this fellow? Should we operate on him while the tumors are small? We might have a chance to save his hearing. Um, do we wait and watch because his hearing's normal? It looks like the, the tumor on this side for sure is on the lower of the two balance nerves, which decreases the likelihood of saving the hearing. Well, um, when we looked at this other image, this is a T2-weighted image where the spinal fluid is white. And we can see that the tumor blocks the spinal fluid flow from getting into the cochlea right here on both sides. There's no spinal fluid getting out there. And when I see that as a surgeon, I say, that's going to be hard. That's going to be hard to get that tumor out without disrupting the fibers going into the cochlea or the blood flow going into the cochlea. And so we said, I don't think it's a good idea to try to take those tumors out, even though they're small and uh, they're going to get bigger and the hearing is going to eventually go down. So uh, that was about four years ago. I saw him back just recently. His tumors are larger. His hearing's starting to go down. 
but he's still surfing, he's still fishing, he, he's really active, he loves to be out and about. Here's his audiogram. The red's the right ear, the blue's the left, and anything above 25 decibels is normal. And he's still in the normal range. So he's living life and loving large. You know, how does that go? Loving life and living large. He's, he's, he likes the choice we made, uh, although we're gonna have to pay the piper at some point. Okay, this is an 11-year-old boy, case number two to compare with, who had a normal evaluation, normal audiogram, um, but uh, he had bilateral internal canal tumors, and his father was a 42-year-old who had large bilateral vestibular schwannomas. Grandfather died at age 40 from NF2. So their frame of reference is a little bit different than the first fellow who has no family history. Okay, here's his one tumor, here's the other, small. They had, he had a little bit of spinal fluid at the outer edge, and we said, we think we probably ought to go after these. We, so we went after the smaller one on the left. And here's his audiogram preoperatively with the most important score being the speech discrimination scores, which were excellent. He was at 96 and 92% respectively in both ears. After the surgery in his left ear, his hearing came down a bit, but his speech discrimination score was still 88%. His clarity when things were loud enough was very good. So we took out the right one as well. Now, did we do the right thing for him? I don't know, I think so. So far it's worked out all right. You know, what if we hadn't saved his hearing in that ear? What would we have done? We probably would have waited and watched on the other ear. But he would have had the option of having a cochlear implant in there, that ear because we knew he saved his cochlear nerve. And that's a whole other discussion for the later talk. But in conclusion, I would say that comparative effectiveness is really very important going forward. And I hope that on the surgical side, we'll realize that we can do the best we can do, but you don't cure a genetic disease with a knife. You know, we're going to have to get smarter about it. Um, I, I think that medical trials are a lot easier to do than surgical trials. About 15 years ago, I tried to do, do a surgical trial and get the NIH to fund it. And I said, you know, what I really want to do is randomize patients between radiation, surgery, and observation, those three. And so uh, they said, well, that, I mean, I actually, I didn't say that. I wanted to do patient choice, like Betty said. You know, I thought that made a lot more sense because I didn't think this would work too well. And they said, no, no, we're not going to fund it unless it's a randomized controlled trial. So I uh, said, okay. So I did a survey of the next 100 patients that I had come through. I asked them if, they, if we had this trial available, would they be willing to consider being in this trial? Of 100 patients, how many wanted to be randomized between observation, radiation, and surgery? One. One. And he was, a, he was a researcher. He said, I might consider it. <laughs> so thanks to the researchers in the group. But, uh, I think that uh, you know, we certainly have to continue to the resolve that you all demonstrate so well to get to the, the bottom of this problem. And I think eventually we have to give them back the normal gene. So I'll leave you with this pretty picture of the Charles River in Boston. We have spring one day of the year, and I think I missed it last week when I was gone. <laughs> Thank you.